Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith. In this video, we're going to learn the two to five player game, Dead of Winter by Plat Hat Games. Here, each player controls a small group of survivors that have come together to form a colony to try and manage the harsh winter conditions of a zombie apocalypse. So you're gonna have a lot to deal with including the other colonists and their questionable ambitions. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up the game, place the main board and the six separate locations in the center of the table. Then give each player a reference sheet. In this example, we'll set up a three-player game. As a group of players, your colony will have an objective it is trying to accomplish. This is determined by picking or randomly choosing one of these main objectives and placing it on the main board. Here, you will find additional details for setting up the game, victory conditions the players are collectively working towards, and a relative indication of the game length. For an added challenge, flip the objective over and play in hardcore mode. I'm not sure I'm ready for that just yet. For this raiding party objective, we need to set our morale to 5 and the rounds to 6, which we track with these markers on the main board. We're also told we need to add two zombies to every location. Each location, which includes the colony home base, has spaces marked with the biohazard symbol for placing zombies when required. These are also known as the entrances to those locations. The colony actually has six different numbered entrances. When adding zombies, you place them one at a time, starting at entrance one and then counting up. For example, when placing two zombies, we would do it like this. If later we were told to add seven more zombies to our colony, we would do the same thing again, starting at entrance one and putting a zombie at each numbered location. When we get to entrance six, we place our seventh zombie back at entrance one. So if left unchecked, the early entrances are going to fill up the quickest. We'll talk about the dangers of that a little later. Along with the main objective, each player also receives a secret objective that they need to privately complete in order to win. There are both non-betrayal and betrayal secret objectives. Separate them into two shuffled decks. Then deal two non-betrayer objectives per player into a single face-down pile and shuffle in one betrayal objective. Now deal one to each player and then return any unused objectives back to the box without looking at them. Because you're not allowed to reveal your secret objective to the other players, you'll never know if there's a traitor in the group or not. Unless you're the traitor. These are the crisis cards. Shuffle and place them face down here on the main board. Also shuffle and place face down the crossroads, survivor, and exile decks. You can remove any crossroad cards with this symbol in the bottom right hand corner to adjust the maturity level to your audience of gamers. I'm playing with my younger son, so I'll remove those seven cards. There are several item cards included in the game. Along their bottom edges, they will indicate the location that they belong to. Sort them into separate piles, shuffle, and then place them face down on their corresponding locations. This will leave you with 25 starter items. Shuffle that deck and deal out five per player, returning any extras to the box. Now deal four survivors to each player from the survivor deck. Players will pick two to keep, shuffling unchosen survivors back into the deck. Each player now chooses one survivor to be their group's leader. Their other survivor becomes a follower. Each player now collects the matching standees for their survivors and three dice. Now all of the colonists are moved to any empty space on the main board for colony occupants. The player whose leader has the highest influence, which is this number shown here, will collect the first player token. That player goes first in the round and will also break any ties that might occur. And finally, all the remaining survivor, zombie standees, tokens, and dice should be placed in easy reach of all the players. And that's the setup. In Dead of Winter, you'll be making choices to guide your small group of survivors towards completing the secret objective you were dealt. Oftentimes, this will include completing the main objective. Unless you're the traitor, in which case your ambitions will be very different. But you'll still want to blend in with the rest of the colony so they don't vote to exile you, which could make things a little more difficult. 
the game will end when the group objective is completed or when the morale or round tracker reaches zero. The game is played over a series of rounds, each divided into two phases, the player turns phase and the colony phase, both of which are detailed directly on your player reference sheet. The player turns phase begins by revealing the top card of the crisis deck. The outcome of this card, which is bad, will resolve during the colony phase, unless the players work together to avoid it. And we'll see how that is done a little bit later. Now all of the players ensure they have the correct amount of dice. You'll always get one plus an additional die for each of the survivors in your personal group. That's why at the start of the game, you have three dice. In future turns, you may have gained or lost survivors, so now is the time to adjust your die pool. Either way, all of the players now roll their action dice and place them in the unused action die space of their player sheet. Now players take their individual turns, starting with the first player. On your turn, the player to your right first draws a crossroad card, reading the italicized text privately to themselves. If at any time during your turn your actions match what is written there, or if that situation simply becomes true, the player holding the crossroad card will pause the game and read the entire card out loud for all of the players to hear. It will detail an event that is occurring and then present a choice. If it lists those choices as numbered options, then the current player, whose turn it is, must pick one of them to resolve. If it lists the choices as thumbs up or thumbs down, then all the players at the table get a vote. Players may talk about what to do first, but then, after counting down from three on zero, they must all reveal their vote. Ties, as always, are broken by the first player. After a crossroad is resolved, you just remove it from the game, but it's possible that during a person's entire turn, they won't trigger the crossroad card, in which case it's just placed at the bottom of the deck. At the start of the next player's turn, the player to their right will draw a new crossroad. There are many different actions you can take during your turn. Let's go over them now. As many times as you want, you can play items from your hand to resolve their effect. Each item comes from one of seven different categories that are represented by these symbols. For example, this is a food item represented by the can symbol. When played, it allows me to take a food token and place it in the food supply. The start of the item's text will also tell you where to place the card once it is resolved. In this case, it says waste pile, so it would go here. As you'll see later, waste piling up is bad for the colony. If the item is listed as an event, then once it is resolved, remove it from the game. If it says equip, then attach it to one of the survivors that you control. Instead of playing a card for its effect, you may also add any number of them face down to contribute to the crisis. These are always kept secret, unless you're using an item that was earlier revealed and equipped to one of your characters, because those also can be contributed to the crisis. We'll see how this is resolved a little bit later, but items you add matching the symbol requested by the crisis card will help you prevent the crisis. Items that don't match will make the crisis more likely to occur, and that's a good indication there's a traitor at the table. Speaking of which, once, during each of your turns, you may initiate a vote to exile one of the other players from the colony. I'll explain what happens when you get exiled a little bit later. Now these items that you need to collect in order to prevent a crisis, perhaps complete your secret objective, or just equip your survivors so they're better able to survive, will be found outside the relative safety of the colony headquarters, in these six exterior locations. Each location has a legend showing in descending order the kinds of items you're most likely to find there. So at the gas station, you're most likely going to find gas, but there is a small chance you might also encounter some other survivors. Each survivor you control may be moved once during your turn, as long as the location has one of these empty spaces for the survivor to move to. But traveling is risky. Each time you move, you need to roll the exposure die. If you roll a blank side, there's no effect. If you roll a wound, you place a wound token on that survivor. Once a third wound is received, the survivor dies. If you roll frostbite, you take a frostbite wound, which counts towards your three wound total, but also, at the beginning of each of your turns in future rounds, that survivor gains one additional wound. 
If you have more than one frostbite wound, you still only collect one additional wound at the start of your turn, but odds are good that will kill you. When a survivor is killed, remove their card and standee from the game, and then reduce morale by one. If they died while at the colony, any equipped items go back to the controlling player's hand. If they died at an outside location, those equipped items are shuffled into that location deck. If it was your leader that died, immediately replace them with one of your other followers. If it was your last survivor that died, remove all of the cards in your hand from the game, draw a new survivor who becomes your group's new leader, and place the matching standee in the colony. Finally, on one side of this 12-sided die, you will find the bitten symbol. Not only do you instantly lose your survivor to a zombie bite, but the effect spreads to the survivor at your location with the lowest influence, in this case, Edward White. The player controlling that survivor must now make a choice. Kill their survivor and end the spread, or roll the exposure die again. If they roll blank side, the effect stops and their survivor is spared. Any other symbol rolled will cause their survivor to die and the bite will spread again to the next lowest influence character. And don't forget, each time a survivor dies, morale reduces by one. And remember, the colony itself is a location, so when moving home, you still need to roll the exposure die. Oh my goodness, a bite here could be really devastating. If it's not stopped, it could spread throughout the entire colony. We'll talk about helpless survivors later. Sometimes they can be added to the colony, just know the effect of a bite cannot spread to them. Just to be clear, if you roll a bite when moving to a new location, the effect spreads at the location you were going to, not where you came from. Another action that I have is to request items. So I need to specify the category. I could say, I need fuel. Then all of the players at the table, if they want, can pass me fuel cards from their hand. But I must use those items right away, although I am not allowed to contribute them to the crisis. You can also hand off items by taking an equipped card from one survivor and passing it to another survivor at the same location. If the item has an ability that can only be used once per round, and that item was already used, the new survivor cannot take advantage of that ability until the next round. We'll see how dice are used in a moment, but another action a player can take is to remove any number of food tokens from the food supply to increase the value of unused dice they previously rolled. Food is typically needed to feed the survivors, so you may want to consult with the group first, but on your turn, if you want to swipe some or all the food for this purpose, no one can stop you. Now you might have noticed from the player reference sheet, these are called action dice but we just went over a bunch of actions that don't even require them. And that tells you that no matter what you roll on your turn, there's going to be lots of things you can still do. That said, there are certain actions that will use the dice. Let's go over those now. To complete an action that requires a die, you have to be able to move one from your unused action die pool to your used action die pool. Sometimes the die will need to be showing a specific value, but other times it doesn't matter. For example, if you want to clean waste, you move a die of any value to the used action die pool, and then you are allowed to remove the top three cards in the waste pile from the game. Keeping your waste pile below 10 cards is very important for your colony's morale, as we will see later. You can also spend an action die of any value to place a barricade token on an empty entrance space where one of your survivors are located. When a zombie goes to a location, it is first placed on any empty spaces. But if there are none, and a barricade exists, remove the barricade and don't place the zombie. A barricade basically cancels a zombie that would have been placed. You may also spend an action die of any value to attract two zombies from any location to the entrance spaces of a chosen survivor that you control. Each survivor you control has a special ability that explains where, when, and how it can be used. If there is a number listed before the ability, that means you must spend an action die of that value or higher in order to use it. Unless it says otherwise, you may use that ability more than once per turn as long as you pay the appropriate die each time. If no number is listed, an action die is not required to activate the ability. 
If you have a survivor at a location other than the colony, and there are cards in its deck, you may take one by performing a search action. You do this by spending a die equal to or greater than the search value of that survivor. The value is shown here beside the magnifying glass, so I could use this die to search. You then draw the top card from the deck. You may add it to your hand right away if you want to stop searching. Or you can continue rummaging around and draw another card. But that will force you to place a noise token at the location. As long as there are empty noise spaces, you can keep adding tokens and drawing new cards. When you run out of spaces for noise tokens or decide to stop, you then pick one of the cards to keep, adding it to your hand, and return the rest to the bottom of the deck. Hey, I found junk! I'm sure that'll be useful for something. We'll see why noise tokens are bad in a little bit. Now, as long as you have the appropriate action die, you can search multiple times during your turn as long as you spend a die each time you search. And the final action. Players may use a die equal to or higher than a survivor's attack rating, which is shown here above the search rating, so a 4 in this case, to attack a zombie or survivor at their location. Let's say Edward chooses to attack this zombie. Just like that, the zombie automatically dies. However, any time a zombie is killed like this or through a card effect, the survivor responsible must roll the exposure die and resolve it, just like we showed when moving to a new location. If you attack another survivor at your location, let's say Edward decided to attack Loretta, you must still use an attack die with the appropriate value, but now you roll it. To succeed in the attack, you must roll equal to or less than the attack rating of the survivor you are assaulting. In this case, Edward would have missed. Let's assume I had rolled a 1. On a successful attack, the survivor receives a wound. And unlike a zombie, you do not roll the exposure die for this kind of attack. Like searching, you can attack multiple times during your turn, as long as you spend the appropriately valued die each time you want to attack. Now that said, you can't target your own survivors or helpless survivors. I haven't explained how helpless survivors that are represented by these tokens enter the game, but that's because they're added when a card effect tells you to. Although no one specifically controls the helpless survivors, they still have an impact on life in the colony. For example, when a helpless survivor dies, you reduce morale by one, just like when a regular survivor dies. They have some other effects as well, we'll look at those in a moment, but when a player has finished taking all of the actions that they can, or want to, their turn is over and play passes to the next player in clockwise order and then they take the actions they want to. And so it repeats around the table until all the players have taken a turn. Now if that seemed like a lot of actions to remember, don't worry. You don't have to. They're all listed right here on your player reference sheet. Including that important reminder that at the beginning of every person's turn, the player to their right draws a crossroad card. After the player turns phase, it's the colony phase which has several steps, but they're all very short. We start by feeding the colony. Count all of the survivors, including helpless ones, within the colony home base, but ignore those colonists at other locations. Now divide the number by two and round up. That's how many food tokens you must have in the colony food supply. In this case, we have seven survivors. Divided by two and rounding up means we need four food tokens. Now, if we had a fourth food token, we would just remove the four of them Feed the colony and everyone would be happy. If you have any leftover food tokens, they stay there for the next round. However, if you have less than the required amount, like we do here, then you don't remove any of the food tokens. Instead, add a starvation token to the supply and decrease the morale of the colony by one for each starvation token there. Now, on a future turn, as long as you can feed your colonists, you ignore the starvation token. But again, if you can't feed all of the colonists, you would add another starvation token, and now morale decreases by two. And you can see how additional helpless survivors can be a burden on the colony's resources. Now check the waste pile. For every complete set of 10 cards, reduce morale by one. The colonists don't appreciate living amongst their trash. Now it's time to see if the crisis was prevented. To do this, take the items that were contributed, Give them a quick shuffle. This way, nobody knows which items were submitted by which players. And then, count each item that matches the required type, 
as written on the crisis card, as a success. Three successes. That's good, because for this crisis, we needed to have three food items. That would mean the crisis is avoided. We don't have to resolve the event written there. Oh wait, there's one more item in here, and it's medicine. Who put that in here? Okay, so whenever you take an item that is not one of the required types, it subtracts from your successes. So now we only have two successes, and that is not enough. That means that this crisis now has to be resolved, and it is always bad. Some items like this food too, says that when played for its effect, it will add two food tokens to the supply. However, this still only counts as one food item when contributed to a crisis. Regardless of the outcome, the crisis and all of the contributed items are then removed from the game. Next, we'll add zombies. At the colony, count the number of survivors, including helpless ones, divide by two, and round up. That's how many zombies you add, and in this case, that would result in four zombies being added to the entrances at the colony. For all other locations, you add one zombie for each survivor there. If there are noise tokens at the location, remove them one at a time, and as you do, roll a single six-sided die. If the result is three or less, like I've rolled here, add another zombie to the location. You've probably noticed there's limited space for zombies at each of these locations. If you ever need to place one, and the location is already full of them, that entrance is said to be overrun. And instead of placing the zombie, you discard it and kill the survivor at that location with the lowest influence. In this case, that's poor Loretta Clay. Let's see if my roll is any better for this noise token. Yes. If an entrance is overrun at the colony and there's no survivors to kill, instead, remove a helpless survivor. If there are no helpless survivors, then nothing happens. But remember, any time a survivor, helpless or otherwise, dies, reduce morale by one. In the rare case that you run out of zombie standees, the game includes some zombie tokens that you can use instead. But at that point, things must be really desperate. After adding zombies, check to see if the main objective has been completed. If so, the game ends immediately. Otherwise, move the round marker down one position and pass the first player token to the right, starting a new round of play. The game also ends immediately if either the round or morale tracker reaches zero. When the game ends, for any reason, all of the players check their secret objectives. If they've completed everything, they win the game. If not, they lose. So it's possible that everyone will win, everyone will lose, or some combination of both. And don't forget, there's multiple items you need to complete. If you're not the trader, one of those items will be also completing the main objective. And that may seem hard to do all by yourself, but remember, everyone at the table, except for the filthy trader, will also be trying to complete that objective. So you'll have some help. Now, there are a few additional rules we need to go over. Let's do that now. If an effect resolves that would cause a player to add new survivors to their group, they draw the top survivor card, add it to their followers, and place the matching standee in with the other colony occupants. This survivor may be used during this round, but you don't get the additional action die from it until the next round, just before you roll your action dice. Card effects override the rules explained in this video. And if two effects would seem to resolve at the same time, the first player determines the actual order. Also, this means that you cannot interrupt an effect currently resolving by playing a card. You have to wait until the effect is over. Finally, I need to explain what happens if you get exiled from the colony because the other players voted you out. First of all, you draw the top card of the exiled deck. This explains that if you were not the betrayer, you reveal your secret objective. Now you can let everyone know they kicked the wrong person out. Unless one of the people kicking you out was the traitor, they're feeling pretty good about themselves right now. <laughs> this will also replace your secret objective with one or two new ones that you'll now have to complete. If you were the traitor, this tells you not to reveal your secret objective, but to replace the first item on your objective with a new one written here. Any survivors the exile player had inside of the colony must now be moved to other locations of his or her choice. You still follow the normal movement rules, but this doesn't count against those survivors one movement per round. 
The exiled player may never move their survivors back to the colony for the rest of the game. They also can't add cards to the crisis or helpless survivors to the colony. So if instructed to, just ignore that portion of the instruction. Any new survivors they gain are added to non-colony locations of their choice. They also may not spend food tokens from the supply to adjust their action dice values. But for each food card they play from their hand, they can adjust their die values by one. Any time an exile player plays an item that would normally go to the waste pile, it is removed from the game instead. Exiled players cannot vote, and the colony doesn't lose morale when an exiled survivor dies. But you must be careful about exiling players. If two non-betrayers are ever exiled, morale immediately drops to zero. And that's how you play Dead of Winter. Now there are some variants included in the rulebook. For example, there is a fully cooperative mode where you remove all of the secret objectives and always use the hardcore side of the main objective. You also remove anything showing the non-co-op symbol. There is a variant that allows for two players. It follows the fully cooperative mode, but now you start with three survivors instead of two and an opening hand of seven items. There's another variant to increase the odds of there being a traitor, and one that includes player elimination, but I'll leave those for you to discover on your own. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. But until the next episode, Thanks for watching.